This is brought to you by WUNC Music. Bull City in the Basement presents Gift and Gab. I'm DJ Who for the crew. Thank you all for streaming this. In the building I have with me the one and only Tyra Scott, also known as Sater Black, educator, vocalist, <laughs> producer, all of that good stuff. What's up? All the good stuff. I'm doing good. My day was good. How about yours? Uh, my day was a little hectic. Uh, it's always hectic around this time, but you know what? Mm -hmm. Um... You know, we're doing what we're supposed to do, so that's all that matters. Yeah, it's hot outside. It is very hot, you know, and it's like, it's not getting any cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Until like September, the end of September. <laughs> so look, um, so I've been doing Gift and Gab for a minute now, and it's very dope that you are with us Thank this you. evening. I wanted to give you your roses. Um, you're somebody that I've always admired, uh, someone that I've always considered to be a very skillful musician, not just a musician, but an artist. And I feel like people should know more about you, especially on this platform. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, well, I'm ready. Yeah, we're going to tap in and really get to know you. So I want to get to know two people. Okay. I want to know Tyra Scott, mm -hmm. and I want to know Sater Black. Okay. They're different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's start with let's start with Tyra Scott. Okay. You know, you can you can start by telling us a little bit about where you're from. Okay. Um, I was born and raised here in Durham. Uh, people don't believe me when I say that, but I was. And so I went to Pearson Town Elementary, Rogers Heard Middle School, Hillside High School, and I went to Central. So I, I'm a child of public school, and um. I what did I do with my childhood? I did a couple of extracurricular activities, but I was mostly uh, come middle school. I was always at home. Um, our parents just bought like one of the first MacBooks that were desktops that were like flat, flat for the time, um, and it had GarageBand on it, Ooh. and I was like, "What's that?" <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, dad taught me like the ropes, like general, and then I never got up. I didn't do anything after school other than my homework, and then I went straight to the computer, and I was like there until it was time to go to bed. And so that was when I started producing. It started as simple covers at like maybe eleven years old. Hold on, wait. You were you were operating. Garage fan mm -hmm. at eleven years old. Yeah, that is so crazy. No, for real. So, what year were you born? Nineteen ninety-five. All right, so you're all right. So you're like five years, four years old, younger than me. Mm -hmm. Um, wow, eleven years old. I was taking piano lessons, and I had like the the Casio keyboard, like you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> yeah. like the beginner keyboard. Yeah. And I used to mess around with little beats on there, and you know it had all the cheesy like standard Ooh, books yes. and cats and boots and cats and. <laughs> With a little feel like thicker, thicker, them doom boots and cats and boots and, but yo, yeah. that's that's so complex. Like you were operating like full professional recording software mm -hmm. at eleven years old. Yes, and it that's just where I was. I would mess with stuff. I would spend time like making something and then just going through all the voices, all the instruments. Like oh, I like that one. I like that one. I don't like that one. And GarageBand was so new; they didn't even have like where you could favorite certain things. So I had a notebook and I was like, I like this path. <laughs> oh so I didn't know what else to do. Um, but I think for me that came naturally because I remember when I was in pre-K around like four or five, I knew where C was and that's all I knew. We had a piano at the house and I asked dad, you know, he would, Play some things but he never like forced um, musicality onto me it was just like around me and he never was like you know we're gonna do piano lessons we're gonna do this that he never did that um, my dad's a bass player guitarist so he's just like real chill laid back and Durham legend Durham legend he I, shut out the window Scott <laughs> I grew up on Jocko Fred Hammond Ooh. Wayman Tisdale what else a bunch of basses, like that was pretty much it. Um, what is his name? Abraham Laborio. <sighs> That's what I grew up with. So it was always around me. So he never really had to force it on me. So that was my dad's side. My mom 
uh, was trained to be an opera singer, so music was just always around me 24-7. But uh, when I was around three, four, only knowing where C was, I never saw sheet music yet. I didn't know what that looked like yet, or at least I couldn't identify it. So I would take a piece of construction paper, mm-hmm. <laughs> fold it in half, like hamburger style, and then like right where the line was, that was where C was. Yeah. And I would put a bunch of lines above it and below it. And like, if I heard something, I would start with C and I would like put dots like on the pitches and then go home and just like, have that to read so I remembered what I thought about in daycare and I would tell show my dad and dad he would suck like see it and be like oh oh okay cool oh my goodness so I guess garage band came it, it made sense like Macintosh made it make sense yeah with the piano roll and like drawing things out and automating then in middle school in the sixth grade dad um, was actually speaking to someone you had on the show before, um, Darnell. Yep. He got Reason 2.5 from him, and he brought it home, put it on the computer. And I remember opening it, and I was immediately stressed out. I was terrified. It was nothing but knobs and buttons and LED lights. I didn't know what anything meant, so I did not touch it for the first three years that it was on that computer. I didn't touch it. Until one day I was like, let me just open a demo song and just press every button and turn every knob and unplug every wire until I know what that is. What's pan? What's that? What is attack? What is release? Because I didn't know what that was. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how I learned uh, how to use Reason. And I've been using that ever since for everything. And so I think that was around the time that Sater Black was born and she was just like whenever I would do stuff she would just be like yeah I like this so I have I also have a uh, synesthesia so synesthesia is a neurological condition um, in layman's terms it's like if you experience one of the five senses you experience maybe another or like maybe two more I know some people that can like taste colors and stuff like no drugs no drugs just like taste color or they can see tastes they put like colors to taste or they can hear something and like feel something like they say that like they could have their hand right here and be like oh i feel like fur when i hear wow this but me it's mostly colors and sound so uh every pitch has a certain color to me every letter the alphabet has a color and a gender weirdly enough and numbers days of the week uh months of the year all the other stuff i mean it sounds more more of a superpower to me man it 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 hurt and it helped it definitely hurt a little see bit that's what school. all the superheroes say you know, with <laughs> because, the great power comes great responsibility like in music theory it it helped uh in theory but in the classroom I had to learn how to like turn that off and it was really hard because I've had it ever since I was existing and I just found out what it was in high school. So that was when I finally decided, okay, let me learn about why I can't learn right <laughs> yeah. and let make it help me, especially going into school for music. But uh, the color black is the only color that my brain does not associate with any sound. The only color. So that was, that's basically the color that my brain associates with like peace or just silence. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I surround myself with it. And that's why it's the only color that I wear. <laughs> I mean, it's... And people it, are like, I love your aesthetic. And I'm like, I do this to survive. But it, thank you. I mean, it's, it's also interesting because, you know, people have a way of when they see certain images and when they look at other people, you know, they tend to put you in a box you know not specifically mm-hmm. you but in general people like it's we're conditioned as humans to mm-hmm. classify and categorize things but you know honestly in your situation this is not like like your image is, is not like a, a fad or a trend it's like literally who mm-hmm. you are yes it's it's so funny um with with synesthesia in some certain people comes perfect pitch and i happen to be one of those people as well 
and don't go around saying it because people are trying their best to get it but the people that do have it know that it sucks like if you're in a choir or in a small ensemble of any kind let there be an acapella tune and you have like 13 different opinions of like what a c-sharp is it's, uh, it's it's interesting there's a there's another woman in the triangle that I know uh, her name's Shayna she plays saxophone mm-hmm. and she also has perfect pitch and she I remember her saying the same thing to me mm-hmm. we were in a woodwind section like some years back mm-hmm. I want to say it might have been central or might have been some big band it might have been John Brown big band but I remember when the horns were tuning up and when instruments were tuning up like she would just be cringe in her seat yep. Because of all the tones, they, you know, she's analyzing all of them, each individual one, and they're all playing simultaneously. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's difficult. It's real difficult. I luckily I, have, I also have a background in like theater, so I know how to like not like on stage when someone does something like really really bad or wrong. And another thing with perfect pitch is like people think that if you have it everything else you do is perfect no it's just i know when i did something wrong like that's all it uh that's all it does for me it's like i know when something's wrong it doesn't automatically make me seem great or on pitch every single time because i'm a human being i can't really do that but it just helps you it it's just recognition pitch recognition and you're just recognizing that that wasn't right. <laughs> wow. <sighs> Theory. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, it was it was tough. School was tough, but it it made me a better person. Shout out to Central. I love y'all. Yeah. I, I was going to say, because I remember, like, around the first time that I met you. Um, and actually, like, I heard, I heard about you. I want to say... You might have been in high school at the time. Well, first of all, I I played in in a band with your father. Mm-hmm. It was like the first church I played at when I moved here. Victoria's Praise. Yep, and he was in that band. I always thought he was like mm-hmm. like the coolest person <laughs> because everybody would just be trying to figure stuff out at the rehearsals, and he would just be uh-uh. there. Just that's because he's at home at his desk, uh, just going for it. Every single time he has to learn something, or even when he doesn't have anything to learn, he'll find something to learn. Like, he'll be sitting there watching Criminal Minds, going through, like, just stuff. He has, he also um, played bass uh, for quite a number of years that I've been in Black Nativity here. And every single December, November. You got to explain to the people what Black Nativity is. So, Black Nativity is a play by Langston Hughes that uh, we in Durham, um, a company called Triangle Performance Ensemble does. Um, They do it in Greensboro, they do it in Raleigh, they do it all over the place. It's not, you know, just one particular company's play because it was written by Langston Hughes, but we put it on every year here in Durham. Um, They're probably gonna get me to come back. (laughs) But, um, so, I have been playing the role of Mary since, I want to say, 2013. So apparently I still look like a 14-year-old virgin to them, which is beyond me, but okay. So I've been doing that, and my dad wanted to get involved, and so he was like, you know, I'll, I'll play bass, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And so um, by that point, especially after 2013 when I graduated, I would come home, dad would always be at his desk with his giant white binder writing stuff out and my dad he's just now getting to the point where he's learning to read sheet music so it's literally just d sharp this e flat that we're in this key this happens right here and he has his own way of notating it just like i did as a child in daycare everyone has their own way of notating things before they learn how to notate it so that everyone else can understand but that's why he's in rehearsal and he just knows what's wrong. He already knows like what it's supposed to be. And then that way, since he knows everything, he he's not, none of his brain space, none of his brain power is going towards, okay, what comes here? What comes here? It's just, what did we do different? What did we change in rehearsal? 
um, he really did instill in me that rehearsal is the time for like polishing what you learned by yourself at home. And so I try to live by that as best I can. That's so dope. Huge shout out to your dad, by the way. Like he, he's so, he's so cool. nice. Yeah, yeah. He's but so it, but it's but it's also like he has an edge. It's like mm. a very subtle edge where I feel like yeah. he could be like a secret agent to. I don't you. think there's a room that I've been in yet where people didn't know me as his child, and that would irritate some people. But I'm proud of my dad, so they'll just be like, "You don't know who that is," and then they'll do like do one of these things. And say his name. I actually did. That. Yeah, I, I did that. <laughs> they do that all the time, and so they look at me, and then I guess I have to like make a little face because it's like a couple faces I make that I look just like him, and they're like, "Oh, got it. Wow, okay," or something like that. But my dad is really, really cool. He, um, you know, I I inherited the love of music from him and my mom, but he never was like, this is what you have to do. He always supported whatever I wanted to do because honestly, it was, if I didn't become a musician, like if I didn't go to school for music, I would have started studying to be a mortician. That would have been what I wanted to do. So I was like, you know, I might just do music. And at the time I had friends who were also musicians whose parents were just like, no, get a job that like is stable. And so I'm around them all the time. So I go home and I'm like, I want to go to school for music. And they're like, we'd be surprised if you did anything else. <laughs> they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. And yeah. I was like, well, it's not stable. And they're like, okay, but is it what you want to do? Okay, then that's stable enough. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's <Okay>. real. <laughs> so, so let's, let's talk about, let's talk about your music currently. Um, the journalist in me, mm -hmm. even though we, we are friends, the mm -hmm. journalist in me had to do my research. You know, I had to I had to <laughs> dig up some stuff. You know, mm -hmm. Get on get on my thing. But um, <laughs> so looking on your social media and uh, looking on your inner looking on the internet, mm -hmm. SoundCloud, mm -hmm. uh, found a lot of dope music, um, YouTube. Uh, but also, I noticed something like when I look at your Instagram page, um, it doesn't strike me as a music page right you know? i like that's I, good <laughs> that's so good and, i love it but but i think it's it's dope though because what i see in you from the outside looking in mm -hmm. i see more than music I, I see someone that's actually curating a culture um that is slightly so i started saying this thing like a couple years back called unconventional blackness this okay. this idea this idea kind of going against this whole idea of black culture mm -hmm. being a a monolithic culture. Yes. Oh gosh. So and you know and I think we we um we really inherit this as millennials because you know we're growing up on TV, we're growing up on the internet. Um I found out that a lot of other people like myself really like anime. Right? You know and at I the time to. but when I was younger don't do this to me because <laughs> there's two favorites there's like the okay. generic my generic favorite and then there's like the favorite that i pull out for like the real heavy anime watchers okay so it's like my generic favorite of course is dragon ball z okay. that was the first one i got into okay my second one is yu haku show oh spirit detective okay 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 that's a good okay i think my generic one would probably have to be full metal alchemist any of them it's a good one. And then I have like a couple of like ones where I'm like, I'm not going to recommend it unless I know <laughs> yeah. like you're good for it. I love Black Butler. That's my favorite like of all time just because of the period it's set in. Like it's in Europe. It's like like the Victorian era. It's just amazing. It's just so good. And it's dark. Like I love it. I love dark stuff. I'm I'm chaotic. <laughs> But I mean, I, I see, I see that in you, mm -hmm. and I think that it's good for North Carolina to have artists like yourself because I think a lot of times, especially as Black artists, mm -hmm. we get thrown in this bubble. You know, this, if you live in North Carolina, you got to do R and B, Southern. You know, it's got to be have a very prominent churchy influence, mm -hmm. and it's like I I hear all of those things in you because you're a product of of your surroundings and your environment. Also, you're a technician at your craft, so you have you had to have studied those things. Yeah. But 
I think ultimately you took all of those influences and created something that you can call your own, which is, you know, I, I tip my hat to you. Thank you. I, I feel like even, even in the things that I like, even in the things that I spend my time on, there's still more to life than that. So when people, uh, I barely have a black card by black people's standards, honestly, because I feel like I only have it because my parents were black. But um, there are a lot of things that I haven't done, seen, like by standards of black people that I should have already liked, seen, done. And so, like, there's movies that I haven't gravitated to that you should have seen as a black person, according to black people. Things you like to eat, I don't gravitate towards any of it. Um, I just learned how to play spades and it was like from TikTok. It wasn't even from a black person. Like not, not a single black person was like, here, I'll show you. It was just, you don't know how to play spades. That was it. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just, I'll learn. I'll Google it. Google's free. I'll do that. And um, so, yeah, I, I just say there's just, there's always more to life. There's, it, it's just, there's more to it. Whatever you like, there's more to life that's not everything so in that I find comfort knowing that there's nothing that I have to uh hyper fixate on there's not there's not a, another person or another identity that I have to try to be or to like shape myself to fit because it's like there's always another one it doesn't it doesn't really matter there's there's always more to life period so um, I know, well, my parents, they raised me on a lot of different music. Like I grew up listening to Bollywood. Um, a lot of, I listened to some like Hungarian, Bulgarian music growing up. Like it was never just what was here in the Americas. And so a lot of my friends, when I do like send them stuff, like I always do, they're like, oh, I, I hear like this, like I hear a bit of like Indian or, you know, I've never heard this with this before and honestly it's not something that I'm trying to do it just if, if it sounds good it sounds good so if you know I hear like a loop of a Greek instrument in something I will put it with some 808s just because just because it sounds good it wasn't intentional or anything like that but you know there there's no box for me so I I don't look for one and I don't, I don't even try to make one for myself. I just, I'm boxless. <laughs> so it's a dope, dope way to put it. Thanks. So you are Grammy nominated. Yes, I am. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I had to really be around you <laughs> <laughs> and just really like share friend-like experiences to, to find that out. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't think it's something that you that you wear on no. your sleeve per se, but no. it's it's a dope accolade. Thank you, thank you. It's I upon receiving it, I learned how easy it was to get nominated, which is why I guess because it it wasn't a win, I don't really like I wear it even less. So it's like you know, oh, I was acknowledged. That's nice, but what else? Like I. I was also taught not to like, you know, rest on your laurels. So, mm. you know, I'll put it in my bio, but you know, what, what else, what, what comes after that? A lot of people just be like, Oh, I'm Grammy nominated this. I'm Grammy nominated that. And I'm like, okay, what, first of all, did you win? And secondly, what are you going to do with it? Third, if I have to add one, what's after that? What else are you putting out there to win again? Or what are you doing with that platform, are you just sitting on it and just telling people that you are Grammy nominated and you know your accomplishments have a, a bigger name attached to it that isn't yours? I mean, it's fine. It's a very good thing to um, aspire to. I'm not knocking it at all because it is a wonderful thing to be acknowledged for your contribution to the world. Like, I believe that more people should be acknowledged. There should be way more nominations than there are, but I always would like take in, in a or an accolade and be like, okay, thanks. 
okay, now I know I can do that. Let me try to do something better. And, you know, sometimes that takes time. Like, after the nomination, like, I didn't really do anything. I was also going through, like, a bunch of mental health stuff and all of that. And that was more important to me than putting anything out. Like, a lot of people, a lot of people got mad at me because I stopped putting stuff out. And they were like, you know, where is it? where's the album? I hear that all the time. Like, where's the album? I'm like, first of all, you're not helping me. And second, I have a lot of other stuff that's like more important. I'm about to move to be a middle school chorus teacher, but you want to know where the album is. That's a lot. That's, that's no, crazy. I mean, it's, I I have, get it. yeah, I get it too. Like I have these internal <laughs> talks with myself all the time on, you know, when people say that I don't, there's, I don't think it's, there's any malicious intent mm -mm. or anything like that mm -mm. that comes with it. I think it's more so just the natural. Just hear more. Yeah, and it's it's the natural consumer in people. Yes. Oh yeah. When we when we when we find things that we like, we just want more of it. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. we don't we don't necessarily think about what it's it like takes for it to anime, be produced. Like when you get to the last episode and you didn't know, mm. and you're just like, "Where's the next episode? <laughs> Where's the next season coming? Oh my god, I have to wait another year." Okay. Right. So I get it. Yeah. I totally get it. So I I think that's taught me that's taught me grace. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Wow, this is a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> it is a lot. <laughs> this, this is a lot of this is a lot of information. It's a lot. It's a lot, but it's it's good, and it all comes together somehow. Like everything fits together. It's a lot though. It's a lot of ingredients. Yeah. So so as an artist, uh, as a musician, what are since since we're on that topic of mm -hmm. of mental health? Uh, side note. I've been going to therapy consistently this year. Um, it's it's so something I'm, that I'm very proud of. I definitely needed my wife to like hold my hand mm -hmm. into into getting therapy, but I definitely think it's some something that everybody should have. Like everybody, everyone. I like there was a meme going around that I shared every single time. I was like, when I get rich, you're getting therapy, <laughs> you're getting therapy, and you're getting therapy. Everyone's getting therapy when I make it, when I can afford it. Everyone's getting there. It's, it's important. So, what are what are some things that some some challenges that you that you faced as an artist and you know pursuing your career? Um, I feel like well, number one, being black that's that's its own you know not problem but you know difficulty right there. Even in our own music, it's still a difficulty because then there's sub genres of black and all the other stuff. Um, it's kind of a I mean it goes along with it but it reminds me of this uh, quote that I read I don't know who said it but it was about the holocaust and they were like basically paraphrasing they were like you know first they came for the Jewish people and I didn't say anything and then they went for the people that didn't have blonde hair although they might have had blue eyes I didn't say anything then they came for me and then there was no one else to speak for me or, or whatever. So, like, whenever, like, there's a genre of something, like, if there's a divide, there's always more divides underneath that divide. And so with black people, we do that a lot to ourselves. We do that a lot to each other. Um, so that's one thing, just being black. And then there's being a woman. That's its, oh, my God. It's, there are horror stories that a lot of women artists black women artists could tell you about that they just don't because they're so scared of being uh blacklisted um you would most people believe you know she's crazy don't work with her instead of being like you know what i'm gonna listen to what she has to say like what was her experience with this person or whatever so for a while um a quite a few people that I've worked with, you know, that would happen. Like if I didn't, you know, form a relationship with them, like romantically, or if I, you know, just wasn't being the kind of whatever they expected of me outside of the studio, it would hinder, you know, our process in the studio. A lot of projects got abandoned that way and all the other stuff. So I had to uh, and it started when I was really young, so I really had to learn, especially in therapy, that, you know, that wasn't entirely me. You know, it's 
it's other people's expectations of me that I just didn't fall into and it, there was just a disagreement on what I was supposed to be for them so um therapy has also taught me a lot of grace um I don't I don't get angry at things that I used to get angry for a lot of um broken relationships like in the music industry things like that um you know most of them I've gotten the courage to reconcile on my own uh, even if you know that's another thing even if you don't think you did something wrong like there's always something to apologize for even if it's like your side of the misunderstanding so therapy has taught me so much in you know just just being like a human and like a student of life like always something to learn um but yeah just being black and being female and also not fitting into not perfectly fitting into any other boxes that have been laid out for you to step into so you know a lot of people would ask me you know what what genre what genre do you you know what genre do you sing what genre do you produce and I've never been able to answer them because you know I I do a lot of genre blending I I well, that's one thing I do do on purpose yeah. sometimes. So, um, you know, I would take like maybe something classical, put it with something folk, and then again, be 808s because I love them. <laughs> like just put them in there and then people are like, okay, now I don't know what this is. And so um, people would ask me what kind of singer I am. And I'm like, I'm just a singer that happens to be singing this genre right now. I'm not a classical singer, although I'm classically trained. I'm not a jazz singer. I'm just a singer that's singing jazz tonight. I'm singing jazz for you tonight. And so, um, oh, excuse me, esophagus. So there was just a lot of different, like some hurdles are small. Some are like really, really big. Some you just got to walk around because they're so tall. And um, yeah, therapy has been my saving grace many times, many times. You know, people, people often when we hear these these horror stories about the industry and just the vicious just just how vicious it can be often we we hear about it on the mainstream level like you know like all up there mm -hmm. but i think a lot of people don't realize that you know it's just it's the in the industrial complex as a whole and yeah. it trickles all the way down to like your your local community artists you never know what they're going through no you don't yeah you really don't. And 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 as consumers, we can be so demanding mm -hmm. of the people that are on these stages and behind these microphones. Like you, when you when the next time you playing? When are you when are you putting out this album? You know, it's and it can be hard. I I totally yeah. understand that. Another side of it, a lot of people don't know that it also breeds like enabling. Like you you're such a loved person that you can do no wrong and it gives you cover to do whatever you want and so I've seen that happen quite a few times to me to other people and I, once again we don't want to say anything because we know that there's going to be another attack or a lost opportunity if we do say something so I had to therapy also taught me like don't be afraid of that because if it's something that you have to shut up about it you were not you're not supposed to be in that space in the first place the space that's meant for you you don't have to be anybody other than the person that you are um I mean of course be professional but like you you, you won't have to lie you won't have to um become someone that you're not proud of to please somebody else so I that that was another thing that I learned a lot of last year and like a little bit of the beginning of this year so yeah I've grown quite a bit it's it's actually like very very interesting to see like even to the point where things I, I'll see things or I'll remember things and where it would like trigger me it just won't anymore it's nice <laughs> awesome Thanks, well it, well um we you know I've had I've enjoyed this so much. I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Um, Gift and Gab is is all about highlighting artists that that deserve, you know, <laughs> deserve <laughs> de deserve a spot where people can 
you know, just hear their stories. So yeah. your story is unique. It's one of a kind. And I know that people are going to hear this and just be so inspired. So, so. so before and before we uh, part ways, I know you got a lot to do. Um, just tell people where they can find your, your content so that we can keep up with what's going on in your world. Okay. So um, SoundCloud, just Sater Black, S-A-T-Y-R-B-L-A-C-K. I'm on Instagram at S-A-T-Y-R dot B-L-A-C-K. And that's pretty much the social media that I have publicly at the moment. I'm working on something. It's in the works, but I am in the process of moving and becoming a teacher. So it's going to be a little slow, but it's it's on the way. I work on it every day, little by little. Awesome. Well, Sater. Yes, Sater. Sater. Yes. I want to thank you so much for joining us here on Gift and Gab. That is our time. We look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. And we're going to end it with an anime piece.